Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today is just, I'm so excited about today. I get to sit down. I mean, technically this is an interview, but really it's more of the opportunity for me to sit down with my dear friend, Lisa Ann. I'm so excited to have her here. So Lisa, thank you for being here. I'm so excited this worked out in person. I know. We got used to doing remote interviews but it's kind of lame. And mm-hmm. now that we can be right across me, I got to interview you, but it was remote and this is just great. Yeah. I find, um, the, in the zoom interviews are, are tough, especially if you're working with someone who is a bad connection, which has happened to me a few times it's the worst. because the delay and you end up like talking over each other a lot. And it just makes you realize how much we read body language in person. Like, cause generally you can talk, you can tell if someone's about to say something, but uh-huh. like, you can't really sense that like on a remote, you know, meeting or or podcast. So you just always end up stepping on each other. You step on each other. And as the person that's the host, you're worried, how is this going to edit? That was kind of blurry. Is that going to come out clear? Are we Mm going to have to clip that? Should I re-say that? Like Mm -hmm. all of that happens. Totally. Yeah. I've definitely had it a couple of times where I'm like, okay, stop. All right. (laughs) Let me say that again. Um, So, and also just like the energy is different, you know, being in person. It is. And it's so great to see you. It's been since 2019. Wow. God, so much is, so much time has gone by. I know. And it's a blip, but planning this trip to come and see you and to have you shoot photos of me was just, it's a huge like part of my life and being back here with you. It's just driving up the lane to the ranch. I was like, wow, like this has been half my life of being in the valley, like just driving through the valley. Mm-hmm. You drive through all these locations. You're like, oh, there's a shoot house there. Oh, just for Drake's house is over there. Like mm-hmm. we're driving over and my, my girl was like, this is just all porn land to you. I'm like, well, that's how I learned my way around the valley. Yeah. Go right. to shoot locations. Why else would you be driving in a cul-de-sac in the valley? <laughs> you wouldn't. Yeah. And it's funny too, because a lot of like the classic shoot locations are no longer there, you know, and like new places have popped up and it's, I mean, it's still a nightmare trying to get shoot locations. I'm sure. To be fair. It's just, I find I'm doing a lot of stuff downtown because there's so much open space there, you know. Which is a nice drive for you. (laughs) I say that in jest. (laughs) It's great. It's like an hour, hour and a half. Might as well get a hotel and just stay down there for two days. You know what? I don't mind the drive so much. It's the parking. Yep. The parking is, especially with my van, I have this huge equipment van. And so most underground parking spaces won't let me park there. Sure, it's too high. Yeah. Or they just won't because they're dicks. Or they look at me and the parking will say like $5 all day. They will literally look at me and just guess. I've been charged $45 to park in like an open parking lot. And there's nothing I can say. No, there's nothing you can do about it. And also the spots are narrow. Yeah. So you've got to wheel in one now. So great. There's a spot. Oh, I can't fit in that one. Okay. There's a spot. I can't fit in that. Oh, there's a motorcycle. Yeah. And then unloading. Yeah. And then loading. Anyways, I'm sure this is thrilling, (laughs) thrilling conversation. This is riveting podcasting right here. And we're glad you're here live if you're here live. (laughs) (laughs) This is to sit here and just complain about shooting for the next hour. Believe me, I can do that. But let's talk about you and about how much your life has changed. You're back in New York. You live there now. Um, You are no longer in the adult industry. You've made this incredible um, transition to mainstream, which I think is enviable for so many people, you know. I always make this joke, but it's kind of true. Like porn is kind of like the black hole. You know, you have to move faster than the speed of light to get out because it's very difficult to make that transition because of the stigma attached with the work that you do. And I I know I've asked you this question on a previous podcast, but not everybody's seen all of my shows. So like, why do you think that you've been able to make that successful transition? Uh, Tenacity. You know, just just understanding that there's going to be more no's than yeses. Mm-hmm. Understanding that when I walk into rooms, there's going to be people that make me feel very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And being able to live in that discomfort. And I think I know it more now than the mystery guest. Mystery guest. <laughs> <laughs> just no, no bueno? I'm sorry. Um, I think I know it more now than when you asked me last time because I've seen more. And I realized that you're in your own head a lot when you're in this industry. We do get a lot of discrimination. We Mm -hmm. get a lot of people judging us. But then when you get out, 
you realize that there's a lot of totally fucking awesome people out there that don't give a shit about what you did. And that mm -hmm. so much of stuff that I was thinking and feeling was maybe in my head. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started to project something different, I think a big change was the first thing I did when I left the industry was got my boobs reduced. Mm -hmm. And they still look big because I got so much smaller since then. But they were huge. And I knew that I would feel more comfortable going into a room when I was an A38 triple D, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was the steps that I took, but then also I've gained, I've gained a lot of faith in people because I've met so many people now in the other side of the world that didn't care. That look at me and go, hey, however you did your thing, look at you now, you've made money, you've saved money, you've met people, you've traveled, you've seen the world, you've done all these things. And I would say, I thought it was going to be like, 25% of the people would accept me and the other 75% would be difficult. Mm -hmm. And it was the opposite. And being a part of Sirius XM for seven years and walking into a building where everyone treated me so well, nobody lowbrowed me, nobody was judgmental to me. It just gave me so much more confidence to walk into other places and be like, well, I just was at a Christmas party with 5,000 people and everybody's super cool to me. I can go into this place now and talk to these people. Mm -hmm. And so I've gained a lot of confidence by the faith that I've been shown in people. Um, and also it's interesting that during the pandemic, more people came to me and said, you know, you'd be really happy that you live for you because now here we are locked in our houses. And most people are thinking about all the shit they wish they would have done in their life. Mm -hmm. And you did whatever you wanted. Yeah. I, you know, you, you touched on basically like the law of attraction, which I believe so much in, and especially like, you know, as I've become older and wiser, I, I think that that's so true. And, and you do carry yourself with this sense of like this, this kind of confidence and assurance that I think commands respect. And it's so much, you know, people are attracted to or repelled to the, like that energy that you put out. And it's that weird kind of indescribable aura. And it, I just think it's such a powerful thing because, you know, people like you, and, and there's definitely other names, there's like Sasha Gray, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure I could think of some others, but there's, you know, other people who have made that successful transition. And I think that, you know, I think, I think Sasha said something when I asked her about it, she was like, I just, I don't know. She like, wasn't stressed about it too much. She's like, I just knew I had more to offer the world. And I just like did my thing. I think if you live in like this fear of the shadow of the stigma, people sense it. You know what I mean? Like people treat you the way that I think you command to be treated and the way you treat yourself. And I also think moving to New York has been a huge help for me. Mm. People are so much less starstruck. People are not asking for photos. I walk down the street and people are like, yo, Lisa, what's up? They yell out their car. Yo, Lisa, what's up? I yell back, what's up? I keep walking. Nobody has time. People are trying to get a train. They're trying to make it somewhere on time. And, and it's just this movement and people are... I guess they've seen everything, right? And it's not, they're also not starstruck by mm -hmm. anybody because there's so many celebrities that are just walking in Central Park and it's yeah. just normal. Um, you can hide through more clothes. But I think New York gave me a lot of confidence because I didn't feel like I was always being stared at. Mm -hmm. In LA, even when I come back to visit, we went to a sushi restaurant a visit or two ago and one guy realized who I was and then every single dude that worked in the in the back came out one at a time and walked by my table and stared at me. And at that point, I can't eat. Mm -hmm. Like at that point, I'm uncomfortable. In New York, nobody does anything like that. I remember that happened with us when we went to lunch, remember? Um, where did we go? That place on Melrose. Yes. And that guy like followed, recognized you and like followed you to yes. the bathroom and like waited outside yes. the bathroom. Yes. I remember that happening. Yes. And like me kind of being like, what is that guy doing? Oh, that was a great spot too. They had that good jackfruit. Oh, that's yeah. right about that It was spot. like a vegan place. Yeah, it was right by Trashy it was Lingerie. Like an R. Yes, right. Uh, red, red, red something. Red something. Ooh, real food. Real food. R E E L, some, right by Trashy. Yeah. But anyway. so I think that helped me get out of my fear of looking over my shoulder and being mm -hmm. so stared at. New York's given me a ton of confidence. And I have yeah. this 
whole new life there where, um, you know, I have my new restaurants that I convinced to go with recyclable materials for their takeout so that I would order takeout. Like I'm now that person Mm -hmm. in a city that's like, I love your food and I'd love to take it to go, but you use plastic and I can't do that. And will you go to recyclable? And yes. And now I have spots like that. They know me as being recycling girl. You know, they don't give a fuck about me being Lisa Ann. Weren't you like head of your HOA when you were here? I was the president of my HOA for two full terms. Yes, I was. Are you doing like the same kind of thing in New York? I'm not uh, because I'm renting, which is such a freeing thing for someone who owned a home since she was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. Nothing is better than something breaking and going on an app and 24 seven, a dude's going to be at your place in five minutes fixing that thing. And you tip them. You know what I mean? Like, but you don't have to have creeper in your place. You don't have somebody who's, oh, you're Lisa Ann. Like, no, they all work there and they Mm -hmm. all want their job. But yes, I was the president of my HOA. And now when I come back to LA, I stay in that building. And my neighbors are a little distraught that I'm not the president because there's some jinky things going on. I with the bet HOA. you got shit done. So this is what I, I do <laughs> is I teach them how to write emails to get things covered under the HOA. Like you have to write that the water came in from outside. It's very important. If it comes in from outside, it is the HOA's responsibility. But the HOA will try to say that's water from inside your unit. No, no. <laughs> you have to prove it came from the outside. So I write them the emails and then they cut and paste it. So I'm still secretly working on behalf of the residents. <laughs> That's so amazing. Yeah, we had a woman that was 15 months behind on her HOA dues when I took over. And I said to the last president, like, what are you doing? He's like, well, she didn't answer her phone, whatever, whatever. I'm like, I'm going to shake this bitch down. So I shook her down. I I got her with her. Just imagine you showing up at someone's door demanding HOA dues and just then, like, just imagine if they knew who you were, like, you know, like some she knew. young guy or something. Like, it's almost like I could almost see a beginning of a porn scene. I knew like that. she had the like, money, too. She was just ignored. She was just in denial about paying it. And I was like, here's what we're going to do. I'm either serving you and we're going to evict you. And we then own your property to sell because an HOA can do that after one year. You don't pay dues. Wow. So we're either flipping this bitch or you're going to give me a down payment right now. I had a check day one, that first HOA meeting where I was the president. I threw that check down on the table. I'm like, this bitch is paying. We're going to be caught. They were like, yes. And I had to campaign. Okay. I had to go door to door to my neighbors, only 14 units, but still I only needed two couples on board. They went and talked to everybody else for me. Doesn't matter that she's a porn star. She is going to be the best HOA president we ever have. I was still in the business then. I was shooting scenes and then coming home and sweeping the property so I could save some money because I wanted to raise the value to sell my property. Mm -hmm. And I tried, I had an agent come in and she said, your place is great, but because of your HOA, you're going to lose a lot of money. We needed a new roof. Uh, We needed some exterior work done. So I was like, all right, I'm on it. It took me two years, got all the work done and then got the money I wanted for my place. Nobody gets shit done like Lisa Ann. It's fucking amazing. (laughs) It was fun. It is. It is true. Jordan and I were, Jordan is um, my assistant. He's also worked with Lisa. We've known him for years, but we were talking the other day about how like you should really do like a handbook. Just for like, but and not even because we've talked about this before. The basics: packing your wardrobe bag, because we taking care of your skin and hair. Your right. Nails. We talked about like you doing like a like a like a handbook or like some kind of one hundred and one for for porn stars because you're just the most organized person in the world. But like you could literally do that for anything. Sure. Like have you, your shit together. Be on just, time. Okay. So, how do you always have your shit together? Like, do you ever get tired of following through on stuff, or is it like? one of those things that drives you where you're like, I can't sleep at night until I do this. Like, is it ever a burden to, for you? Or do, is it like, does it bring you great joy to like cross something off your list? So I've learned to not take on more than I can handle. Mm. And I've put myself in a much better pace because yes, it used to burden me and it used to cut into my sleep time. Mm -hmm. I had no social life for a period of my time in the industry. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm, I became a minimalist and I got rid of 75% of my belongings and moved into an apartment and simplified my life. I only take on what I really want to be invested in. And I've spent more time, whether it's virtually, even during the pandemic, FaceTime or with people in the past two and a half years than I had in 20 years. Mm. More quality time with my friends. More every night I'm on a FaceTime for two hours with a different friend. Um, Just connecting with people because before I had so much on my to-do list and as the person that I am, I had to get it done. So what would sacrifice would be me, Mm. my being. So now I just pick my pleasure 
And the things that I'm committed to, I commit, but I say no to a lot more than I ever have. Mm-hmm. And I allow myself days like where I'm going to get a massage and then I'm going to go home and either watch some horrible binger of like 90 Day Fiance, some trash TV, mm-hmm. where I'm going to read. But I will take a day where I don't talk to anybody and I just want to be doing nothing. Mm-hmm. So from the exterior, it looks like I'm working all the time. But really, I've just paced myself to kind of perfect the projects that I'm doing Mm -hmm. and not overwhelm myself with things that I really don't want to do. You know it's a no. When someone asks you and you're like, I really don't want to, but I'm going to because I need the work or I'm going to because I like them or I'm going to. I don't have those ties in New York. I had them here. Yeah. See, I struggle with that so much. And that's something that I've been thinking about a lot because I've, I mean, look, I'm fortunate enough that. I built a brand and a name that people come to me for stuff, especially since I did the podcast. I can't tell you how many people come to me. They want me in their documentary. They want to interview me for this. They want to interview me for that. But they don't want to pay that. you. Of course not, which right. I understand. Like you don't get paid for documentaries. Like I get that, but I can't do every single document. Or I have people who just want to interview me and ask me questions about a documentary that they're doing, but they don't want, I'm not going to be in it. They're using you for your, their homework. I actually do now say to them, if you'd like to pay me a consulting fee, I'll answer all the questions you want. Yeah. My time is worth something. And they're appalled. Yeah. But I've had two pay me. Yeah. So I got to say no to 20. Yeah. It's a lot. It is a lot. And it's like, and and I, and I hear that because I don't want to become that person because I remember when I was trying to get somewhere and I needed advice from somebody, you know, um, if they wanted a consulting fee, like what I would think about them, but you're right. Because like you get to a point where I cannot say no, yes to everything. No, Like I just like it cut. And then, especially now that I have a child, like if I'm going to spend this day, like work for sitting down with you to be interviewed for your documentary and you're not even going to put me in it, which, you know, that might be valuable for me in a way where I would get like FaceTime and sure, publicity. Sure. Um, then I can't work on these other things that I really need to get done to make me money. Right. So it's just like, and I think that's something I didn't really understand until I'm at this place now. So it's I tough. am trying to say no to more things, but like in and a kind The documentaries way. too, quite a few times I have done things for people and then I don't like the tone of how the documentary, yeah, totally. like they come to me with this idea, like it's going to be a positive take on the industry yeah. and we're going to talk about female empowerment and this and that. And then four months into these weekly phone calls they want you on and can you give me this person's phone number? And you don't want to give it, so you got to reach out to that person yeah. and ask them if it's okay. Four months down, it's like, oh no, this is going to be about agents and the horrible things that they've done to people. We've decided to, and I'm like, that's not what I need to be giving my time to. I don't mm-hmm. want to burn bridges. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think I'm part of a negative conversation, Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people. And, you know, in journalism, they do pay their leads a lot of times Mm -hmm. because they're going to make money selling this product to Netflix or they're going to make money. You don't want to pay any of us, but yet you want me to be at your disposal for eight hours a week to talk. No, no. Yeah. I I just say I gave that up for Lent and I'm really sorry I decided not to do that. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I think the the time management and the saying no no. and trying to kind of simplify your your life is is something that I was forced to deal with um, when I had a kid because I had suddenly had less time. I didn't want to work 24 seven. You know, I wanted to have time to see her. And you also need time to take care of you, whether it's doctor's appointments or whether whatever it may be that you want to do for you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we put that aside to do all these little things. Mm -hmm. We put us aside. Yeah. Take care of everybody else. Was there anything in particular that like, did you feel like this was a monumental shift um, to your new way of thinking and your way of, um, you know, creating those boundaries or is it just something that like kind of you slowly started to adapt as time went on? It was really a monumental shift of my mindset. I felt more empowered. I felt stronger. I felt satisfied with what I was doing and didn't need the extra Mm because all that really becomes is extra. And yes, you can get a little leverage out of being in a good documentary, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it comes out and you really don't. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, Oh my gosh, I gave this time. And I just felt this feeling of if I'm going to be doing something, And it's going to be just volunteer work. I'd rather do actual volunteer work. I'd rather raise money for a charity. I'd rather be a part of the group at MoMA that helps raise money for something. I'd rather do something that's just feeding my soul instead of feeding somebody else's project. Mm -hmm. And then the learning to say no was just once I started doing it, how good it felt to have more time for my people, Mm -hmm. how good it felt to celebrate my friendships and be like, man, this is just so great. And yes, I'd love to help you with this, but I have a friend's wedding. 
mm-hmm. and I'm not going to cancel it. And I want to go a day early to hang out with everybody. Things that I never did before. Yeah. I just feel like I'm living. Yeah. What do you find that you value the most in life right now? My relationships for sure. And it, it, it can bring me to tears to realize how little I valued them for so many years of my life. Yeah. Because I didn't have strong ones. Yeah. And now that I do, it's just, it changes your life. Yeah. You know, I think so much, so much of what we seek in life, money, success, career, cars, we think is what's going to lead us to good relationships, right? Because people are going to like us. People are going to find us valuable because we have those things. Yeah. But then we find that the people who do like us because we have those things are not the kind of people who value people. Right. And it's very empty. They love things instead of people. Yeah. And this expression that the minimalists use that I love is use things, love people. Mm-hmm. Stripping down my life, the hardest thing to get rid of was my car. Mm. Because a car is a sign of independence, right? Mm-hmm. We started driving. And as soon as you got a car, you were like, I can just go take a drive. I can get away from my parents. When I was young, we could put a handful of change in our gas tank and go somewhere. And I remember sitting at the dealership, turning in my car before I moved to New York, thinking like, I am absolutely stripped down to nothing. There's nothing identifying me as being different than anybody else. A better car made you feel like you were better than somebody else sitting in traffic. And now I don't have a better car. I don't Mm -hmm. have a car. Yeah. And I think that like getting to New York, December of 2019, the world closing in March of 2020 and me adapting to like having no stuff was wild because then it was like, oh, I have all this free time because I'm not managing my stuff. So now I'm just going to talk to my friends. What do you do? Mm -hmm. What do you have free time? Talk to your friends. And I just realized these friendships that I've had. And though I enjoyed them, I didn't value them. And I didn't Mm -hmm. realize how much better it felt to talk to somebody for two hours than it felt to go to the mall Mm -hmm. and buy a bunch of shit Mm -hmm. or to go shopping or to have my car. Yeah, Stripping myself of everything really showed me who I am. Do you think the pandemic had like a big, like how did the pandemic affect your life specifically? I think becoming a minimalist right before the pandemic made my life a lot easier. Mm. If I was still living here and I had four bathrooms, I'd have been worried. What if one leaks? I got to have people come in. Do they wear masks? Do you COVID test them? Like all these things and taking care of a big place. I didn't have any responsibility. So I was on the city bike Every day in the middle of the street in New York City, there were no cars. There was no noise. You would just meet up with other people riding bikes. And there'd be like little bike gangs of different age group people just meeting up. All right, we'll meet up at Times Square. Okay, we'll meet up at the water. We'll meet. And then there's like 25 of you. And you're just tooling around the city on a bike like a child. Yeah. Um, I really lived out my most freeing time. I felt no guilt. I'm not saying no to anybody. I don't have to say no to an event. I don't have to say no to do anything, but I recorded my audio book in my bedroom closet. It took me a month because I work with Kay, who you introduced me to. Mm -hmm. And I knew Kay had no work. So I said, Kay, let's come up with some projects, some things that we could do. I'll find content that you can edit. Um, and, sh- and, and, and they said to me, uh, I just recorded an audio book. I can teach you what equipment you need and how to set up your closet. If you want to record your audio book, I'll edit it. So we did it remotely. Mm-hmm. So I found little projects. I wrote a list of things I'd procrastinated, but I found that I was comfortable in my space because I had less to take care of. I wasn't wrapped up in all the old stuff that I was. Mm -hmm. And I think that beat of my friends all being available to talk, we all bonded. Like we were all on words with friends every day, playing Scrabble, (laughs) (laughs) trying not to cheat. And I really, it put put my feet on the ground. Yeah. I feel like that it changed a lot of people's lives. and Made me so much more grateful. Yeah. So much more grateful. Every trip I take right now, I'm like, so happy to be at the airport. So happy to chat with everybody. I'm like, yeah. we are we are doing things again. We yeah. are out. It's okay. Yeah. It's great. It's funny. I always feel like everything happens for a reason. And then when the pandemic first started, of course, it was obviously, you know, this this huge like stressor and um, the tragedy and, oh my God, what's the world so coming to? So much sadness. And obviously- you know, all of those things still apply. I don't want to discount any of the lives that were yeah. lost or anything like that. But I, I do, you know, I always try to look for some kind of silver lining. And I do think that it really made us all sit back and go like, what's important in life? 
I said at the beginning, people were going to go one more. way or the other. Yeah. You're either going to come out of this a better person or a worse person. Those yeah. are your two choices. And I've seen it both ways. Some yeah. people have become very impatient. They watch too much news. Uh, they, they drank too much. You know, there mm-hmm. were some people that were very destructive, but then those of us that said, what is important in life? Mm-hmm. I have food. I have what I need. I have a roof over my head. My people are okay. Yeah. You know, like you just started to just make the smallest list of things you were grateful for. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, you see it go both ways. I mean, obviously not everything is going to improve people's no. lives and, you know, <laughs> like we have our choices and some of us sure. go down some dark paths and other ones make the best that we can out of it. But all right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about Lisa's podcast, podcasts. She's got two. Um, and of course her new book. So hang tight. We'll be right back. Hey guys, if you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q and A's, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates. All right, guys, we are back. So Lisa, um, let's talk about your book first. So you have a new book out. Thank you to the pandemic. I finished writing my second book. Uh, I will say uh, reading my first book for the audio version, I hated it. Really? You realize, okay, first of all, right when I finished my first book, I put myself on a reading challenge. I read a book a week for a year. Oh, wow. The more you read the better you write. Yeah. So now I start reading after I wrote my first book. And first of all, my first book was like this thick. Now it's like this thick. People want to be satisfied. They want to read it in one or two sittings. They want you to tell compact little stories. Mm -hmm. So I felt so excited to write this one because I knew I could say more things while still saying less. Yeah. And minimalist writing, minimalist writing. (laughs) And it was cathartic because I saw, I told some truths that I did not tell in my first book. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked about my sexual abuse as a child, which is something that I didn't write about in my first book. And at that time I still had a relationship with my family and I was Mm -hmm. still trying to make peace with it. And at the same time, I wanted them to sit down and have a conversation with me about it. Mm -hmm. And at that time there was someone in the industry that had put a tweet out that said, We all know you've been molested by your brother multiple times. You don't have to take it out in the world. And that tweet came out after my book was released, my first book. Mm -hmm. And so now I had this huge question in my mind of like, well, now the world knows. And I protected the world from knowing because I wasn't ready. And I also, my brother's children were younger then. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to protect them and them in school. And now they're older and out of school. And so this book, I decided, you know what, I need to share with the world what my experiences truly were. Mm-hmm. And that was hard. Yeah. It was hard to share. And it was also hard to share. I was a better journaler, but it was hard to share the last interaction I had with my family. The last mm-hmm. interaction was in 2015. And of course they were appalled over that tweet going out. And uh, they were trying at that time to push me away, but I didn't want to accept it. I really wanted to force a relationship through my family. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I asked my mom if we could all sit down and we could talk about it. And it pushed my family away. And I was going to stay for another two days. My mom was like, I think you should take the bus back to the city early. And I knew when she said goodbye to me at that bus stop that it was going to be the last time I saw her because Mm -hmm. she had not been a part of my life from 12 years old to 24 years old. So I knew that she could do that to me again. Right. And that was a dark time for me. And believe it or not, it felt great to put that on paper and to share with somebody that my life is not what you may have thought you saw all the time. Mm -hmm. I post great moments on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I post the good things that I'm going through. We all have something inside us that we're not happy about Mm -hmm. and it's okay. Yeah. doesn't mean you can't go on. I didn't get destructive at that time. I Actually, I had Chris Streams come to my house in LA and take my bar because I had this bar set up with alcohol on it. And I knew my life was too dark to drink alcohol. I just Mm -hmm. knew that that would make me more depressed. So I didn't drink for two years, not one drop of alcohol. I just told myself, this 
I looked at it, I was sitting on my couch one day and I looked at the bar and I'm like, that's going to be the death of you if you keep that thing here. Cause you're going to just start drinking and never stop. Mm-hmm. And I, he came and picked it up. It fit perfectly in the backdrop of his photos. Like I had this whole visual, like he's got a bare spot when you shoot in the living room, this bar will look perfect (laughs) and he'll pick it up for free. And he'll also take the glasses, the liquor and all his friends were tricked. And so sharing that I went through that Mm -hmm. and being able to relate to people who may have seen my life one way Mm -hmm. was really important to me. It was cathartic. It was painful. Mm -hmm. Um, it was hardest when I knew it was being printed because I was like, okay, now these words are printed. Like Mm -hmm. now this is permanent, but you know what? It was permanent in my life Mm -hmm. and never sharing it with anyone was so heavy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it until I started to come clean with my friends. You know, I never told my ex-husband. I never told my best friends. I never told anybody in my life because I didn't want to be broken. Yeah. And when I finally sat down with my friends and they said, well, you know, we assumed that there was some trauma in your life that you hadn't yet dealt with. No one's going to pry it out of you. The first person that knew was a doctor, went to see a therapist about it. And then when I was 30 years old, I had the courage to tell my mom Mm -hmm. and she just brushed it off. And she said, you know, that was a long time ago and you're fine. So, and I was like, I'm fine. Like I landed in porn, obviously, because I didn't value my body and my sexual experience Mm -hmm. because it had been taken from me. I felt like everybody else should have it too. Mm -hmm. So there is a reason. And I felt that she could have had a better talk with me about it. So really putting that on paper allowed me to accept it. Mm -hmm. And since then, you know, I've been adopted by a new family that loves me more than my family ever has. And by being truthful with them, they were able to say, well, you're like our daughter now and you're welcome here anytime you want Mm -hmm. holidays and birthdays. And It was just letting go of it. And the longer I would carry it, the more miserable I would secretly be. And not sharing our darkness with other people isn't healthy. Yeah. And so sharing that was important. I've gotten so many responses from followers that have said, you make me want to be a better parent. You make me want to look out for my daughter more. You know, you make me want to look out for my younger sister more. The responses I'm getting from men about me telling my truth Mm -hmm. has been fascinating. Yeah. Really fascinating about how it impacts them. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, of course, women are going to be open arms about it because it's relatable. Mm-hmm. Sexual abuse is, is real in this country. It's yeah. real everywhere. Well, I mean, almost every woman has, has experienced had experience. some form yeah. of it. Right. So this was a different book. Uh, and then once I got over that halfway through the book, it gets into my new discoveries. Like now that you're stripped down to nothing, why don't you get rid of your shit? Mm -hmm. Why don't you pursue minimalism? Like, why don't you change Mm -hmm. and just take on this light approach to life and, and I've been loving it. Like it's, it was just letting go. And here I was carrying something that made me more short tempered with people. Uh, it, It was everything negative that surrounded me and I never knew it until I let it out there. Wow. That's amazing. So do you think that, um, so you said that you, you know, you said that you got into porn because maybe because of this experience, because you didn't value your body. Do you feel like, so do you feel like you wouldn't have done it if that hadn't happened? And do you regret? I don't regret it? it at all. Uh, and the pandemic made me so thankful. I would text my friends all the time, my single friends, like, I'm just loading up my OnlyFans and thinking about all the great fucking sex I had while we're all quarantined in our own spaces <laughs> with no new relationship. <laughs> like, it made me so grateful because there was this block of time where mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of sex. You weren't going out meeting new people all the time. And right. I'm so glad I did it because I went in broken and the business is what made me whole. The business Mm -hmm. gave me financial security that allowed me to have confidence and make choices and become a business and Mm -hmm. take myself seriously. The business gave me the ability to travel and see the world, like going to Australia for Fleshlight. Not everybody gets to go to Australia on somebody Mm -hmm. else's dime. You know, going to shoot in Hungary and going to all these places I've been None of that would have happened. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would have stayed in Easton, Pennsylvania and married a high school sweetheart and had a bunch of kids and they'd be adults now. And I'd be trying to save for my retirement and still trying to be like, where's that one trip I'm going to take when I retire? Like I've seen so much. So I think the business, I think for me entering was, because I remember being young and having friends in high school say to me, how can you take off your clothes in front of people? 
And I'm like, it just doesn't mean that much to me. Like mm-hmm. my body just doesn't mean that much to me. Like showing it to people doesn't mean that much to me. It wasn't until I saw a therapist that she had said to me, well, of course, something that was taken from you, you don't have the same value of it mm-hmm. as if you had shared it on your own choice for your first experiences. Mm-hmm. So it diminished the value. So it gave it, made it easy for you to go out and share it with everybody else. Mm-hmm. To me, it's more intimate to have somebody that I'd have to my house to watch like a marathon of chopped. Like to me, that's like next level, super private, <laughs> but walking naked into a grocery store would not phase me at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and luckily I was good at it. Yeah. Like I enjoyed the whole set design. Like, Ooh, what are we shooting? Oh, an office set. Well, let me get some cute clothes. I loved the whole preparation for being a porn star. I loved traveling on the road and socializing and going into all these weird small towns and going into these different strip clubs and having to adapt. You know, if you can adapt at a different club every weekend, it makes you a great business person because then you can adapt in any work setting. You're kind of like, okay, this person's this person, this person's this, this, you know, you get to know how to read people. And I, I tell all the girls in the industry now, if you can do something in front of people naked, you could do anything you want for the rest of your life. Mm, yeah, that's so true. And it's interesting too, because porn's like one of those careers where it makes you a small business like yeah. on its own. Like that, I was talking to somebody the other day about this actually on Twitter about um, taxes and like how many girls, like models don't pay their taxes. But but also like we're, we have no financial education in yeah. this country. It's terrible. Like in high school, like why are we not teaching people like senior year of high school about how to balance your checkbook, about how to yeah. uh, open an IRA, right. about how to pay your taxes. We interest, how interest can pay off or how interest can hurt you. We don't teach people that. Yeah. It's insane. So when you become, when you get into the adult industry, just because of the nature of the way that it is, you know, you're your own you know, small business, like you are kind of forced to learn all of these things. And you're forced to learn in a group that may not be so organized. Like you might've not gotten a 1099, but they filed it. They just didn't mail it to you. And then the IRS hits you up three years later. Like you now owe $4,000 on this, like would have been $300, but they never mailed it to you. You're also dealing in a chaotic situation with some of the people that pay you. Yeah. Because they're not necessarily the organized, most organized either. Yeah, 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 totally. Which absolutely reminds me, Ernie, I have your 1099 downstairs. So let me forget to give it to you. <laughs> Shout out to Ernie over here. We're getting you your 1099. Don't worry, we got I you, boo. I to you. You just moved and didn't change the address, but it's fine. Boo. Um, <laughs> Return to sender. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so there's just, um, it's just interesting how it like kind of forces you to learn about yeah. business. And I was just saying like, I wish there was some kind of, resource for girls to, you know, learn about taxes. Learn See, now about- that's something I'd be into. Yeah. I'd be into financial wellness conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, just about the basics, things that I learned a little bit through, like my account would have me photocopy every single check I got whether it was at a strip club or a shoot. And then I'd bring him in the three ring binder at the end of the year. And he did that for people who didn't mail me my 1099s because we got hit so many times mm-hmm. by somebody not filing something and it coming back mm-hmm. to me and me getting a, you know, be served with scary paperwork. Mm-hmm. And it, that little tip was so helpful because then all the checks were there and he'd be able to look through. There was no money unaccounted for. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would love to do that because Everybody needs to learn and it's not their fault. You're making money and spending money so fast Mm -hmm. between hair, nails, wardrobe. There's a ton of receipts to keep track of. Mm -hmm. What can you write off? What can't you write off? You know, Mm -hmm. that would be, it's a huge need. You know, state of Florida, DeSantis is trying to pass a law where high school will have to pass a financial wellness uh, class to graduate. I think that, I mean, of all the things that we need to learn in school, that in sex education, like we, we need to learn that. Like we don't need to learn about, you know, fucking marine biology. Had I known like, that it's 16 when the gap sent me a $300, uh, credit card. Cause I'd been working since 13. My dad got me working papers at 13, had a job summer. It was a full-time job. I was a hostess. I was starting to get credit cards already because I had credit. Mm-hmm. I went and spent that $300 
day one and then just paid the interest for like the next three years. So I started stripping and realized I shouldn't carry all this debt. Then once I used that one, I got another one. Next thing you know, I got like 18 credit cards and I'm only 18 years old. Yeah. They're all only $300, but they're all maxed out at all times because I thought it was free money, Holly. <laughs> I was a teenager. <laughs> I was a teenager. I'm like, oh my God, everybody wants me to, oh my God, sure, I like the gap. <laughs> it's the only place I can spend it. I will find $300 of shit. Day one, I will find... We shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. But yeah, financial wellness is a big issue. Definitely. Um, before we move on, I just want to touch back about your relationship with your family because I think that's super important and incredibly brave of you to come out about because I know that's really hard for a lot of people to talk about. So do you not have a relationship with your family anymore? And I how, do not. How do you manage that now? Like, are you okay with that? I have... I found peace with it. Mm -hmm. And I found peace with the understanding that for too many years, I carried the blame for getting into porn as the reason why my parents treated me horribly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my dad didn't speak to me from the time I was 16 years old till uh, he, I was 40 and he had a stroke and I came home. My neighbor had called me and said, your dad had a stroke and he was fine. But I came home. We connected for a couple of years. It was very awkward. It was weird. So when I wrote about this, when I walked into my dad's house, it was like I had died. He had every photo ever taken of me like on this one wall, like a weird shrine. And then when you go to my mom's house, she wants to act like I'm dead because she doesn't want to associate with me because I'm a porn star. So there's no photos of me in her house. Mm -hmm. So it was like this weird, and the way that alone played on my emotions mm -hmm. was heavy. And again, you don't realize it till it's not there, but I've made peace with the fact that they can never understand me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a small town mindset. They're, they're stuck on stupid with the fact that I'm a horrible person because I did porn. And anytime I wanted to address my abuse as a child, my mom would bring this up. Mm -hmm. And so what I've realized is after the first year, I felt healthier because I wasn't on a roller coaster ride. I wasn't on the, I'll give you an example. My grandfather died. And one of the reasons I got my apartment in New York City was because my grandfather and Peggy, Peggy, who you've heard about, the most important person in my life, mm -hmm. They were both in nursing homes and I could take the bus from East from New York to Easton and be right outside either of their nursing homes and then get a ride to the other one. And for the last three years, they were alive. I visited them a couple weekends a month. I would go either for the day or, or for the weekend, stay with my mom. And when my grandfather died, I had just been there like three days before. She lied to me by a week so that I didn't go to the funeral because they don't want to be seen accepting me because I'm in the industry at that time. And so they lied to me. And then I, I was appalled. And what was crazy was the last visit I had with my grandfather, who had severe dementia. You know, when you're dealing with somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, know this. They don't remember today. But if you bring in things from their past, they can tell you elaborate stories. Mm -hmm. And he was a World War II photographer. And I found boxes of his photos when I was helping my mom clean out their home to sell it because they were both in the nursing home. And I started taking in his war photos. And he would give me these stories. Like he would grab a photo. He's like, oh, that was 1943. We were in Germany. You see this guy right here. He'd tell me these great stories. And then one day, the last time I saw him, I had a shoebox of photos. And he looked at me. He goes, keep these because I think they're going to write you out of my will. And that was like our last conversation. Wow. And then she lied to me about having a service. Mm -hmm. And then I found out through a friend from home, like, hey, why didn't you go to your grandfather's funeral? And then I called my mom and she's like, well, we really didn't want to be seen with you. We don't want to be seen that we accept you. You know, it's okay that you're here sometimes. Like she wouldn't eat out at a restaurant with me. She wouldn't let me go into the store with her. My life with them was at her house or at my dad's house. It wasn't in a public. Mm -hmm. So that's heavy. Yeah. And so after a year of not feeling that, I felt more comfortable in my skin. Mm -hmm. I felt more confident about myself. Mm -hmm. I was around more people that had positive interactions with me than constantly reminding me mm -hmm. of these horrible choices that I made. Mm -hmm. And that last visit home, I was kind of done. Um, and that was why I decided to have this like come to Jesus. Like, listen, I called it Russian roulette in my book. I said, I want to sit down and have a conversation. And I called the person who abused me and had him on the phone. And I said, everybody needs to get together. I just want to sit down. I just want you to know how this affected my life. 
I've already forgiven you. It's already been years, but you have to have a face to face. Me understand what this did to me. And that was it. My whole family got together and said, we're never talking to her again. Wow. And that, and they have not during the pandemic, didn't reach out. Don't know if they know where I live, but I've reconnected with all of my friends from my hometown and during the pandemic, I would rent a car and drive home and see my friends from Easton because mm-hmm. uh, it was supposed to be our 30-year high school reunion and we didn't get to have it. But I am at peace with it because I feel better about myself not trying to prove myself to a family that doesn't accept me and will never accept me. And also, I remind them of bad things. Mm-hmm. I remind them that they failed me. Mm-hmm. I remind them that I've gone out on my own and been successful without their help. I think my parents would have much rather me be a girl in the business who became addicted to drugs and was living under a bridge somewhere. Mm-hmm. They don't want me to be successful. Yeah. Because when I was on Sirius, every time there was a free membership, I would email both my parents. Hey, there's free. You can listen to my radio shows. Every time I'd go home, have you listened to my show? Oh no, we haven't. I realized like you're more embarrassed of my past than you'll ever be proud of my future. Mm-hmm. And so you're never going to support my new way of life. You're never going to support me. Yeah. So I feel ultimately better. It's sad um, my friend who you met today always says, I still put hope in my hope bucket that your mom reaches out because it breaks my heart that a mom doesn't talk to her daughter. I'm like, but your mom loves me and treats me better than my mom ever treated me. So mm-hmm. why would I want to go back to that? Do you think that we as a society put like too much emphasis on family? I do. You because know? if it doesn't work, don't force it. That's a Find thing. your it's- friends that love you and be around them. Yeah, because we always, I mean, we, we always talk about family. Family is so important. Um, you know, love your family, all these movies about reconnecting with your family. And I don't know, it's hard for me to imagine because from my perspective, well, course, as you know, course. like my family, we're all really close and I'm super fortunate in that way. Yeah, you are. So I can't imagine like being disconnected from them, but coming from somebody who struggles with their relationship with their family, like... Is that a healthy narrative for us to push to be like, no, you have to heal. You have to like make your relationship with your family work. If like, it's just not there. If it's toxic, if it brings back old memories that are painful, if there was abuse that you can't get past. And if it's meant to be, let the dust settle, but don't force it. And I, you know, in sports radio, I would always ask people around the holidays to stop saying on air, enjoy the holidays with your family. I would always ask them to say your loved ones. Mm -hmm. So I would like text to producers, like, can you remind so-and-so not to say this? Because there's a lot of people that don't have a great family. And that's why people get incredibly depressed. Depressed during the holidays. holidays. So to make every card say family or everything say family, just say loved ones. We can choose where that love goes. Is it going to your family or is it going to your chosen family? Mm -hmm. But it's okay to be estranged, estranged from your family if it's not a healthy relationship. And I'm healthier mentally in so many ways now that I'm not forcing that relationship to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted it so badly. And looking back now, it had to go through the cycles that it went through because once Peggy passed away and once my grandfather passed away, going home was dark. I had nobody that I was excited to see. Um, I knew my mom was going to make me feel like shit. I knew my dad was going to be like sitting like across the table from a distant stranger who was going to like, tell me who died, tell me who was sick, um, tell me the gossip in our family and never ask about me. Uh, never want to know my dad, never visited me anywhere I ever lived, never knew where I lived. And that's just like, that's a one-way relationship. I'm coming to you, but as a father, you don't want to see where your daughters lived. I remember before I got married, he and I weren't talking and my mom insisted that he meet my husband before I get married. And we pulled up out front of his house. He was cutting the lawn and we walked up and he shook Mike's hand and he didn't look at me once. And he introduced himself. They talked. My mom did her thing. He acted like I wasn't even present. We got back in the car and my husband, of course, was like shocked. He was like, my God, he acted like you didn't even exist. And I'm like, I don't exist to him. So that was a very common thread through my life. And I continued, Holly, continued. It was like the one thing I couldn't check off my list. It was like the one obsession I had mm. that I couldn't correct. The one thing I couldn't do better. Yeah. The one thing, that one thing and letting it go has been really healthy for me. Yeah. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's part of who I am. Yeah. And if my story helps other people understand that that doesn't define me. Mm -hmm. their lack of understanding or our lack of love 
it, it doesn't mean I can't get love elsewhere. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'm not deserving or worthy of love. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't share myself with other people. It just means that's not going to work. Right. And I think that that's a message that so many people um, will resonate with so many people. I mean, you know, I know so many people in the adult industry who are estranged from their family and have volatile relationships with their family and them being in the adult industry has just made it worse. And that constant, like trying to prove themselves, trying to repair that maybe, yeah, maybe all of that effort in the end, isn't that worth it. No, because you could have all that time. I could have been with people that love me for me. Yeah. Like my friends, I've been telling you about the relationships that have become so yeah. valuable to my life. I discounted them while trying to fix this. And really they love me unconditionally. Right. They were there for me, but we all want the love of our parents. Yeah. That's just a natural, normal thing, but not everything works. And it's really something in the industry because most parents, it's so great when I meet somebody like Joanna, I love that her parents are supportive of her mm -hmm. and it makes me so happy for her. Like when I meet a girl that tells me my parents are fine with what I do as long as I'm good with my money, I'm always like, oh, like yes to your parents. <laughs> like, yes, yeah. I love them and I'm so happy there's some of you out there. There's a great, so Alina Lopez, you know her? No. She's amazing. So she comes from a Mormon family and okay. her- family is still Mormon and they fully support her. Her mom made her ABN dress for her. They go to the awards with her. Like love. they are a very Mormon, very religious family and they embrace and love Alina. Good for her. For, and like that to me is so powerful because so often you hear about these religious families that reject their child who's an adult. And like Alina's just a wonderful example of oh. like, that's not always the case. It's not always the case. Yeah. It's so great for her. And it's such so great for her parents too, yeah. because it's, it's important. But for people out there who don't have that, instead of trying to fix something that's broken, sometimes it's just go with the safe bet mm -hmm. and go with those friendships that do love you. Go to those places. Like I'll say your mom made me feel more comfortable in my skin in my young years in the industry than anyone because she was a woman, because she was successful, because she wasn't like everybody else was in this whole gossipy thing. She never gossiped. She didn't give a fuck about what anybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. So being on her set was like actually working and doing really cool things. Mm -hmm. Whereas being on everybody else's set just made me feel so intertwined in the business and who liked who and who didn't like who just wasn't her thing. Mm -hmm. But I saw her as a successful woman and I was like, I can be a successful woman because of her. Like she is, she doesn't care what people think about her. She goes to the store. She's fine. She's saving her money. Look where she lives. Like, look what she's done. Like that was a lot of hope for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one thing that you can say, I want, but she definitely doesn't care what people no. think about her. And she's afraid of nobody. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember telling her how devastated I was that everybody didn't like me when I retired and how things blew up in my face. She's like, what do you want to do? She goes, there's nothing worse than hanging out with a bunch of pornographers. They're, very boring. They're so boring. And she, and then she walked away. Like I'm, I'm pouring my heart out of how upset I am. And she just so put this like stamp on it. Like it didn't matter. And right away I was like, it doesn't matter yeah. because she said that I was like, you know what? She's right. She'd been right my whole career before. Why am I pining on this? But yeah. she made it just like, matter of fact, like, please. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be bothered. But it was important for me to tell my truth. Yeah. And then to share how I took control of my life. You know, going through all of my items helped me get rid of a lot of emotional attachment. Mm. There were things I was keeping because family gave them to me or because of an experience I had. And when you touch everything you really realize how you are connected to stuff. You can take a picture of it and save it, but does it really mean that much? Are you really keeping that ugly sweater because your mom bought it for you and your mom hates you, but you want her to love you? Like, are you really keeping it for that reason? Yes, you were. Like I had so much shit I didn't need, but I was holding on to memories through it. That was complicated too. So going through and touching everything was this like spiritual experience of like, okay, I'm ridding myself of all of this energy. Interesting. Was this like the Marie Kondo? Um... I did The Minimalists and then I found Marie. Okay. At first I watched The Minimalist documentary, then okay. I read their books and then I was addicted. I did the 30 day challenge where you get rid of something every day and day two, it's two things. Day My three, it's three things. That, day so crap. I sold a ton of stuff. I sold stuff. I gave stuff away. I had friends come over, like I'm taking pictures of things. Do you want this? It took me two years to minimize my life by 75%. 
Wow. But I did it carefully, like selling things, old mm-hmm. magazines. I found photos. I found wardrobe. I would sit, I would sit with all this wardrobe on my floor and be like, I don't know where I wore this. Okay, white bikini Lisa Ann. Okay, Lisa Ann sex white bikini. And you'd find the pictures and I'd tear them off the internet and I'd be like, my sexy auctions, bang this bitch up there, I'm selling you. you know? my, I lived a porno garage sale for like two years. Okay? <laughs> I was making money out of my house, okay? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, you know, that's another like wonderful bonus to being an adult star is that like literally you can sell your wardrobe for quite a bit of money. I sell my gym clothes now when they don't fit anymore, okay? Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. not giving up but on this shit. Don't wash them first. <laughs> oh no, do, do not watch them. <laughs> do not wash them. And if you only wore the socks once, they're not good enough. No. Nope. You need to wear them for at least a week. No, no. And if you don't have time to wear the panties for a couple of days, just shove them up your vagina real quick. And just back. <laughs> there you go. Just like one after another. <laughs> but ridding myself of that heaviness allowed me to see life in a better, I wasn't, didn't have this blur here of like, yeah. oh, there's this thing blurring me. Yeah. Once that was out. Now, of course, during the pandemic, there were times where it hit me. I was like, if these motherfuckers don't try to reach out to me, because all I'm blocked from communicating with them in any way, shape or form. Mm-hmm. I wrote my dad a letter. He never wrote back. Um, mom has me blocked from the email. I don't know where her phone number is because she had to change it because I gave it to one girl in the industry as an emergency contact. She decided to send scenes to it for like a week. So my mom had to change her number and I never got the new one. But they, when they didn't reach out, I just kept saying to my friends once a month, if they don't try to connect with me during this panoramic, then we're done. Like yeah. this is it. Okay. Yeah. If, you know, look, if they reached out, I would probably never be able to say no because they're still my family, but I know who I am now. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't allow them to be negative to me or make me feel bad about who I am. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like to me, what we call in, you know, the 12 step program is you kept your side of the street clean. You did everything that you could do in your power, um, to amend that relationship. And now it's on them and there's nothing more that you can do because as we all know, you can't change how people treat you. You can only change how you react to that. But I do have a will. And I am clear that they are not a part of it. Yeah. Because I know they would come after my money if I died. God, so sad. And that's why you get a will. Yeah. Uh, also, I got really into will planning. Yeah, it's a fun business. I would really like to get involved with this business. People do not take it seriously. You could do so much. You could have bottle service at a club. You, how do you want to spend the last bit of your money? You want to have a party? I'm getting my ashes made into diamonds and all of my girlfriends are getting a a piece for a necklace. Oh, wow. I got, I, during the pandemic, I got in three months of me will planning, looking up all this stuff, all these different things you can do. You can start writing people letters and you just give them now to your business manager. And then when you die, all these people will get these letters. So I add on to these letters. Um, there's just little things that I got into it. Kind so. of morbid, but, but necessary. Necessary. Very necessary. As a single woman with no kids and no yeah. husband, the state takes your shit. Yeah. Or your family comes for it. Right. So I wanted to make sure I had that clear and I want my friends to be taken care of. And I set up a trust. So my passive income, residuals, book, all those things Mm -hmm. will be donated to charity once I pass. So Mm -hmm. like four charities, Planned Parenthood, Blessings in a Backpack. So each month a donation will be made in my name. So I'll still be alive. Oh, you'll be alive through your charitable works. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I got into it. God, you really do have your fucking shit together. Oh, yeah, Holy thanks. Shit. I'm old, so I should have. Listen, if I don't have my shit together by now, I'm fucked. <laughs> we can swear on here, right? Yes. <laughs> Just ask now. All right. Um, podcasts. Yes. Tell me. Okay, so you've got two podcasts. You've got Dudes Do Better, and you've got the Lisa Ann Experience. It's the Lisa Ann Experience is a positive note. It's supposed to show me as a bit of a reporter who like researches people and things mm-hmm. and brings interesting guests to share. Mm-hmm. This week, uh, and I, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I have a news obsession. Mm-hmm. So I read at least three hours of news every day of my life, mm-hmm. sometimes four and five. Mm-hmm. World news, but I find the greatest guests through news. I was reading an article on CNN. And don't judge me by the platform. I read all platforms. So Fox, CNN, all of them, you know, not, mm-hmm. not, not choosing my sides. I read an ad about a guy uh, who got out of prison. He started an app. It's going to be the LinkedIn for ex-cons because when he got out of prison, he realized why so many ex-cons go back. Because there's not enough resources. Yeah. So he's going to change what it looks like to be released from prison. Whereas six months before, the counselors will start meeting with them, let them know. You get out of prison with $40. That's all yeah. they give you. And a folder. Here's where your probation officer is. Here, And you have to get a job. 
Yeah. And nobody wants to hire it. Hire a felon. So this is where jobs can put job ads on. And then he also has housing from other ex-cons who are willing to help out for a period of time, what have you. And then when you get out of jail, you register for Con Connect and you're placed and your counselor, it's going to make it easier for parole officers. So I read this article and I was like, I got to meet this cat. Reached out to him on social media. Amazing. Andre Pert. He was my guest this week. So that's my place where I get to take my news reading to the next level Mm -hmm. and like, be a little reporter and be like, oh, I want to meet this person. This is a great yeah. story and I want to share it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then dudes do better is where I get to celebrate. The creepers are always going to creep, Holly. Mm-hmm. Every day there's a new masturbator born. I now know this. Even when you're not shooting, even when I'm 80, somebody's not going to know that I'm 80 and they're going to think that scene was today mm-hmm. and they're going to ask to have sex with me. Mm-hmm. It's just the law of nature. So... Um, I do creeper conversations now where I engage with people on social that are super creepy. And then I read our conversation on the podcast. Uh, And it's also a place where I get to interview talent that's in the industry today, uh, retired talent. It's a place for me to stay connected with the industry and really meet people. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting to interview people I've never met before and some people that I've known for years I just interviewed Sexy Vanessa. Yeah, she's amazing. She's, I got to meet her in real life. Yeah, no, she came here too. Oh, I had, she's like amazing, right? So full of life and so exactly what I thought she was going to be when I met her, just stylish, just over the top, but amazing. Yeah. And she's got a a wild story. Her life story is like a whole mini series. Yeah. Oh, why? I'm begging. I can't believe that there hasn't been a movie made. I'm begging for her to let me ghostwrite her book because I'd really love to start ghostwriting for people Mm -hmm. because I love to write so much. If you could put me in a room alone and not to engage with other people all the time, I'd love that. Uh, I love going into a hole of writing and not coming out for like three days. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I love that I'm connecting back because, you know, you first get out of the industry No one knows how you feel about them. They Mm -hmm. feel like, oh, you think you're better than me. You're not in the business anymore. It's like, no, I just wanted to try something new. But I still love what I did. Mm -hmm. And I still want to meet you so that you have my number. So if you have a problem or you want financial advice or connects for clubs, that you know you can reach me. Yeah. I still want to be that person Mm -hmm. from a distance. And I think it's even better that I'm in New York because people come to, Lainey has the girls come in for PR tours. Mm -hmm. I get custody on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. I take them to Central Park. We do a nice hour walk. We go to breakfast. We walk the city together. And I get to know them uh, in a really personal way. You know, casual, no makeup on. They've already done all their interviews. And so Dudes Do Better has opened that for me. But people really like Dudes Do Better because guys like to laugh at guys that are foolish on social media. Mm -hmm. And women like to know that they're not alone and that they're not the only ones getting creeped on. Because it's not just porn stars. Any woman on the internet is going to get a, I want to be balls deep inside you every once in a while. Mm -hmm. It's that dude. He's out Mm -hmm. there. He's waiting. All caps. Yeah. He's coming. Uh, So I'm trying to point out to my listeners, hey, if you have a friend and you see them saying these things on social media, can you tell them to stop? Do you ever ask them like why they feel that they have the license to say such things? Were they just not like what like what their mother didn't teach them any better? Do they believe that it's actually going to get them what they want? Is it sometimes a cultural thing? Like it's a lot of both. The cultural thing is obvious. In mm-hmm. cultures where they do not know how to communicate with women, where they've just recently got porn, that's a whole one thing. Yeah. Here, it's a little bit of both. A lot of guys will then say, oh, I was just joking and trying to get attention or trying right. to get... So they're needling at you, but I'm like, wow, that could be a trigger for somebody. That's no way to get attention from somebody. Some people want clout. So they want you to get mad. Like I, I clapped back at somebody last week just for creeper conversations, he now turned our thread into a t-shirt that he's selling. And I had a really cute photo with a, with in in this green cube. uh, And it was a motivational quote. Like I like to put out there and he wrote, I can't believe there's not cum stains everywhere. And I wrote back, that's a you thing. Like, obviously nobody lets you come on them. And I'm really sorry about that. You know, like, (laughs) yeah. And he wrote back and then we went back and forth and now he's proud. So he's selling these t-shirts. So some people are just, so sadly, however they can get attention will get attention. So but a lot of the times I go to their timeline and I see their children in their banner. Yes. I see and I think so like, cool. what are you going to do when a guy talks to your daughter like this? Yeah. What are you going to do when your daughter sees that you talk to people like this on Twitter? Yeah. Like, 
It's, they're forgetting that they're not just behind a keyboard. Listen, I just had Chris Hansen on my podcast and we actually used to be neighbors in my old apartment. And I wanted to start showing up at people's doors that do these tweets, like find them through their VPN, then show up with like their family answers the door at dinner time with this like poster of all the tweets. Like, do you know that your husband says this to me on the internet? Just keep pulling them. Like it would be epic. But as that might be too much work, I might put a little time into Facebook because from these people, you can find their Facebook and you can find their whole family. And I just want to send their whole family what they say on the internet. Mm. See how that plays out for them. Like, how does your mom feel that you say these things to women on the internet? Yeah. Just, you know, but it's about time. When do I have the time? One day I'll do that. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, people say that's the, that's one of the, one of the bad things about the internet is that, you know, there's no accountability. None. You just can say whatever you want. You can hide behind a screen name and nobody's ever going to be able to like face to face be like, why would you say that to me? And if you're a porn star and you defend yourself, do you know how many people will come at you and say, well, what did you expect? Yeah. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. It's like, deserve it. Nobody yeah. deserves to be spoken to by a stranger in a disrespectful manner. Right. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but now I make fun of it on dudes do better. And so once a week I have to engage and now, and it's, you'll, you'll love the intro to this. Cause you know, I got engaged. So we go back and forth for a little bit. It is so delusional. The things that I hear people say, but now I'm making fun of it, which makes it easier to process. Yeah. But now it's coming to me less cause they're afraid they're going to get called out. <laughs> and now I'm really upset about this. I'm like, <laughs> well, maybe you could just like license DMs from other performers. Don't worry. I can, I'll just put up a bikini shot or so. I'll just throw up a thirst trap photo. That'll engage, <laughs> engage. Yeah. And everyone begging me on the daily, just do one more scene. Just one more, just for me. Do one more. It's like, if you've seen them all, you should probably read a book. You've seen too many. I've done a lot. Well, I don't need to do more. I've done a lot. It is, sometimes it does shock me, like, how much material guys, like, need. Like, the one thing that I've noticed that guys ask for me on my OnlyFans, because, you know, like, we've talked about this. I, I, don't, I do very little. Right. Very, like, softcore nudes. I don't even open, like, no masturbation, nothing. I'm super, super tame. Um, and people will be like, well, why not? I'm like, just because I don't want to. Right. Like, and that's a good enough answer. Yeah. Like, I just don't want to. But the amount of guys that want a picture of my asshole, specifically my butthole, that is like so, that is the one request that I get so often. And I'm like. I know it's a funny one. Really? Do you think it's because they've never been able to be close up to one? I, you know, I don't know. I just think that they think that, I don't know, because I feel like. Most like buttholes kind of look the same. Like vaginas look different, but most buttholes pretty much look the same. Tell you what, the weirdest so, of all weird like, comments come in that? on OnlyFans. They why really that? do think that membership allows them to ask for some weird shit. Yeah. Like some Pandora's box. It's a page. You see what you see on here? Yeah. There's no exceptions to the rule. If I wanted to do it, I'd have done it by now. You'd yeah. already have seen my asshole. There's, I'd have shown it to you. There's a message in the beginning when you log in about exactly what, what you're gonna get. are. But guys are like, if I just ask, maybe she'll do it for me. And I'm just like, no. And, you know, I used to get really angry and, like, snap back and be like, you know, fuck off. And now I'm super nice about it. Good. I'm like, you know what, sweetheart? I don't have that, but I have this. It's because a curve. Because I'm just kind of like... It's yeah. a curve to get used to any new application, yeah. the emotional toll that it plays on you, mm -hmm. the why, when I was so clear about what you're going to get here, yeah. it makes you feel like, what did your mother never say no to you? Like, yeah. you know, so you get that. And then once you get over that angst, yeah. then you're like, okay, I'll either ignore it or I'll say, hey, thanks, but no, you know, but it's when you stop feeling the emotion towards it, it's way better. Yeah. I used to get mad too. Yeah. Very mad. But like, what are you going to do? Like, oh my God, you've seen me do everything. I need to do more. <laughs> always more always oh they're like well you still look good enough i'm like okay okay it's not about that it's not about that it's nice to have my body be mine again you know i shoot some like shower stuff and i'll do a solo masturbation once in a while um just just for the just for the kicks of it um but it's nice to be in a different space and to be doing yeah. looking at myself differently and also like it's your body you can do what you want right like you shouldn't really, that's the whole thing is like, well, why not? Well, Cause I don't want to. Right. And that's enough of an explanation. 
Yes, no means no. Another yeah. thing we try to teach our dudes to do better. The girl yeah. says no once. She should not have to say it twice. No does mean no. It's simple. Any language. Niet is no in Russian. Yeah. You know, like you can learn it in every language. Yeah. It's all the same. One time. No is a complete sentence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And a powerful word. Yes. Lisa, this has been so amazing. I feel like this is definitely like the most, the deepest conversation we've had. And I'm super grateful. I'm super grateful you for you for years of my life of all the content. You know, mm-hmm. when I put my content on OnlyFans, recycling my stuff, I remember the days that we shot together, the different yeah. locations, the fun, the looking at the locations in advance, all the little things going to Malibu and you just the beautiful content, the days that we had, we laughed. We, yeah. you were a huge part of my growth mm-hmm. and my life. And I'm so happy to be shooting with you tomorrow to celebrate my 50th birthday. I know. I know. We, when is your actual birthday? May 9th. Oh, wow. Kentucky so, Derby weekend. Are you going? Yes. Oh my God. That's, amazing. that's a great way to spend your 50th. I know. Cause everyone there is way older and a lot richer. <laughs> The older ladies there are amazing. I thought the only reason to go was because you get to wear a fancy hat. Love the hats. I've gone before. I love the hats. But so have you picked your hat out yet? You, it's best to get them there because it's hard thing to ship on the plane. And they're, the women that sell them yeah. there are like, there's, every hotel has like women set up with millions of tables. You can spend thousands of dollars in these hats, but it's best to bring your outfit to the tables and match it perfectly because you have to wear a different one every day. It's two days, three days. So you buy them there. My last I didn't time I bought them. I realize, I mean, you're right. Like what? Cause it's a big thing to carry on the plane. Yeah, and like a hat box. Like yeah. are you going to put that in your, that's your only carry on. No way, man. That's not going to happen. I can't like crush it. They, it's not like they compact or fold up. But before we wrap, I'll tell you the one thing I decided to do for the year of 50. Mm. I'm taking one week off a month for this whole year. Mm-hmm. A friend comes to stay with me in New York City. We wander the city. We see museums. We go to the park. And I'm just being present in their company and not working. And to me, when we started this, we talked about relationships mm-hmm. and how much they've begun. That is the greatest thing, to be in a place where I can afford to, that mm-hmm. I can step away from my work and just get ahead of my podcast. Mm-hmm. And I can just be with my people, making memories in the city now that it's back open and we can do things. It's like the greatest way to spend the year turning 50. Yeah. I love it. It's amazing. And of course, you're and I cook. going to actually do I cook for things. all my friends too. I and bet. bake. Oh God, dude, I bet you're great. <laughs> I bet you're great. I love it. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for coming. Um, can you let everybody know where they can find you on social media if for some crazy reason they don't know? Yes. If you may have been blocked and you're following an imposter that's way nicer to you than I am that calls you babe, that's not me. I am at the real Lisa Ann. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. If it's not the real Lisa Ann, it's not me. Don't fall for an imposter. You can find all of my stuff there. My book is available on my store, Shop lisaann.com or you can get it on Amazon as well and I'll be recording the audio version pretty soon uh simple at the really san Fantastic. YouTube as well <laughs> and you can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram also on TikTok uh, Holly Randall unfiltered and um if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please make sure that you like and subscribe. Thumbs up, thumbs up. If you're listening to this on my on a podcast app, I'm considering maybe checking out my YouTube channel. I have a lot of other stuff there that is actually not just my podcast. I do behind the scenes. I do other uh, special Q and A's. So um, check it out, Holly Randall. Um, no, that's not it. It's uh, youtubecom <laughs> slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. That's not it. Or you can just go to hollerandallandfilter.com for all the links. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I don't know why I just did the finger point, but I'm just going to roll with it. I'll see you next week.